Okay, Paul Carter Harrison. Now, um, this particular book, this classic book, yeah. the drama of Nomo. And would you just read the uh, the the sub the subtitle, if you will? Oh, Black Theater in the African Continuum. Now, this is interesting to me because in that era, you had mentioned this that you uh, that uh, uh, one of the Jones one of the Jones boys, Ted Jones, would go back and forth from Africa and Europe, or whatever. And even you came. What time did you? When did you come went, to the Black Arts Movement? You, you was in Europe, and then you came when? Well, I, I was not in the Black Arts Movement. Um, I know you weren't, but I'm saying you came in that space. I came in the late '60s. I, I finally got in that the late '60s, '70s. Oh, okay, okay. Before that, I was uh, I was a renegade. Um, uh, uh, I was a graduate student in phenomenology. For who? Phenomenology and gestalt psychology. What the that's, what? that's what I was doing in philosophy. I was in that work and that doing that work. Well, no, wait, wait, wait. Go back to that word. I got the psychology. The other what was phenomenology? That? Phenomenology. Yeah, and that was very important for me in, in that particular study. In fact, I was sim similar to your situation. I was working on a doctorate in, in phenomenology at the New School in New York in the 50s, late 50s, after I finished undergraduate school where I studied behavioral psychology, I thought that was nonsense. You know, this running rats and sort of like, uh, you know, setting up uh, uh, those um, examination of, uh, um, of um, the, the uh, behavioral responses, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and measuring them in that kind of analysis. And it was boring, for one thing, and I didn't quite believe it. I didn't think I didn't think much about uh, what do you call it, um, uh, Freud, and, and all those boys, and that, 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 that's that subterranean place where you go for the id and all that stuff. I said this didn't make any sense to me. Hmm. So I wasn't going to I was going to drop it out of psychology altogether until I heard a lecture a year later after I graduated from undergraduate school. I heard this lecture at New School. I said, wow, phenomenology, that sounds like something. So I went and started studying it. Now, in studying phenomenology, which talks about a holistic way mm. of understanding the world, a way in which the, 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 uh, the um, you somehow grasp and understand things around you by the, the parts, the, the sum of the parts, you know, begins to show you the whole. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's not that you know. You, you, you don't separate. You can't separate it out. Mm -hmm. and, and I started writing these incredible papers. You know, when I say it, I didn't. I mean, they were not voluntarily. I mean, I was assigned papers to do, and I found myself in the library all the time writing these papers for three years. And uh, just as I was about to finish my doctorate. But while I was doing that, by the way, I was also writing plays, or, or seeing plays. The plays I wanted to see were plays like Adrian Kennedy, The Blacks, mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah, yeah. ritual, ritual, yeah, ritual plays that had ritual kind of movement. And I could not. Uh, 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 the if you said, look, let's go see a Tennessee Williams play, I said, ah, I'm not interested. I mean, see, I miss, I, I'm not. I don't. I don't want. I don't want to see that. Um, there were very few black plays around at the time. Uh, plays by black authors. I was one of the few. I was at the actor studio, you know, I was living in Europe. I was a member of the actor studio. And I would come in once a year for a couple of weeks and do a little workshop on my work at, at the actor studio and then go back. Somebody might pick it up and try to produce it or something, but you know. In Europe, where were you in Europe? Amsterdam. Amsterdam, okay. But while I was in Amsterdam, I was also working, I was also interested in, in total theater, which was. was Sounds like my phenomenological stuff, you know. In total theater, we're trying to do, put together, make sure that, or understand that, you put music, dance, text, all that together as one thing, not separate things. Mm -hmm. And so I was on that track, based upon my studies in phenomenology, Following Peter Brook's stuff, I was about to ask you about Peter Brook and Arto and that kind of. Yeah, I definitely kind of was over there. Mm. I was there, I was following that. I was moving over, and the Arto stuff was very much prominent in my mind at the time when I, when I was living in Europe. And I, and I worked with a group of artists who was who were outstanding, significant people in their fields. A, 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 a major composer, one guy was a major composer of, of 20th century music. Another major uh, uh, violist who turned out to be the top playwright, director of 
kind of avant-garde stuff in, in Holland. <laughs> he left the Concertgebouw Orchestra altogether. There's this group of us. Was, was Gutowski and all them people that part of that too? Or no, that no, Gutowski later? was not part of this, no. Mm -hmm. uh, it was not part of our thing. My thing was in Amsterdam, and I was dealing with the Amsterdam artists. Okay. And the Amsterdam artists had their own uh, international appeal, but uh, that's a, we were the young guys. I was the only black guy in it, but you know. I, I was mean, about to ask you, uh, how did that, did, did, I guess they, 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 I don't want to say just kind of left your blackness alone, but do you, you must have connected on some other kind of well, level the where level they could I really. The level I connected was I came through phenomenology and, 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 and my interest in, in total theater, and I seemed to be better informed, and plus I was an actor studio, and they said, oh, he's really somebody. Yeah. I was young, about 25, 26 years old, and I was over there. And none of my plays, early plays, I think my early plays, I think, I had black characters, but let me see, one, my earliest play, the earliest plays were one-act plays, and it was only, there might be one black, black person in it. And that one black person, it would not necessarily, I mean, it wouldn't, it wouldn't necessarily be something that you would say is a, the black experience, mm -hmm. but it would be the black experience if you look at it very closely. My very first play was called The Post Clicks, about a black guy who was uh, working in a post office. Well. And, and, try, and, 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 and a Jewish guy saying, you know, you can't spend your life here. He's an older guy, so you can't spend your life in a place like this. You know? <laughs> I see, but wasn't, wasn't that sort of weirdly informed by the times? Because back then, you know, if you was a nurse, a teacher, or a postal worker, that was the, basically the black middle class, which goes to the basic question. I have to go now, go to Autobahn. Where were, where were you made in the States? You know, where were right you here, made? in Manhattan. Uh, where, where, t just tell me about this. Was, well, where? I was born in Greenwich Village. I was raised on 111th Street mm -hmm. uh, in Harlem, 111th, right at the other end of the park. Mm -hmm. uh, until I was about 17, then I went back to the village to go to school at the NYU. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, but I, my whole my whole sensibility is formed by New York, by Manhattan, mm -hmm. primarily. So when I left here, the first time it was the first cultural shock I ever had. I left here to finish my undergraduate work in, in Indiana. <laughs> and I was in the worst two years I ever spent in my life. Sorry, in my yeah. life. <laughs> You talk about Mississippi. Yeah. This was some 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 very deceptive kind of kind of uh, you know I say uh, uh, well oppressive situation. It's totally it's clearly the institution, everything about it. Anyway, I got through that. That so so basically, and I guess you know I mean it, it would be things like um, they would say to me things like oh uh, you have to take the speech examination before you go to on to uh, before you graduate. I said, I said, what speech examination? He said, we got to do this. I said, well, okay. What is it? Well, you could, you know, no, you have to take the speech course. I said, no, I don't have to take the speech course. I thought, well, that one, I don't. No, you got to do this. Okay. And it was a, uh, they said you could test out. So I went in there ten minutes, man. They said, oh, you you can pass. Yeah. I said, what the hell were they thinking? What were they expecting? Mm -hmm. Mumble jumbo? What, what were they expecting? I didn't know what the hell they could be expecting. Well, you, uh, 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 not to interrupt you, but there, well, yes, to interrupt you. Uh, I had an interesting thing in uh, Florida where I was, uh, I was living in Delray Beach, Florida, and I, had, I went to the police station because I would get up every morning at 4.30 in the morning and walk basically through downtown, through the rich plain to get to the beach to do my prayer meditation and exercise. So I, for some reason, I don't know, I just, not for South Bronx boys, I went to the police station to tell them I was gonna do this, and, I, and I, at first they were a little suspicious, but then the lieutenant gave me a, his card and put, his, put his, a, a message on the back, please afford Mr. Sloan, blah, 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 blah. Sure enough, the second morning that I did this, the Cost of the woman jumps out of the car. Now this is in the night in the nineties. The woman jumps out of the car. Says, the first thing out of her mouth was, "Haven't I dated you?" And I knew immediately what it was. They wanted to hear me talk. They wanted me to get upset. Da 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 da. da. All, all the rest of that stuff. So that language thing yeah. is very important. If they perceive that you are inarticulate or whatever have you, they're, 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 you're, you're done. It's, yeah. it's called a downtrodden. It's called a caste system, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they they have respect for that, by the way. They have great respect for that. They like to be, to, 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 to create a pecking order with a kind of a caste system. 
within themselves, and not alone, just with, among blacks or others. I mean, that's what they do. And um, so, I mean, because I clearly was not from there at a certain moment, I got a lot of passage. You're from, oh, you're from, you must be from, where are you from? You must be from New York. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. But part of it was a terrible two years. So when I came back, I was still living in a village and studying and writing plays and st doing graduate studies and becoming more informed about Heidegger and those kind of people, uh, you know, philosophically and looking at, uh, and looking at phenomenology and what it meant. Okay. Then I started pursuing the Peter Brook and Otto and Peter Brook and all those guys that went to Europe. And when I got there, they found these guys and we were in love with each other. We, we, were, we, were, the, we, were, we were the rude guys. Mm. We we're going to break the system. We we're going to create a system of work that would, that would break the, the traditional way in which theater was performed in Holland, which was all very classical theater, no new imaginative way of, of producing it. It was just straight up, you know, uh, realism, beautifully costumed, great stuff. And we we're going to be antagonists to that. Mm. While I was doing that, I was brought an African, um, a couple of African books came to me, The Sacred Systems. Mm. I started reading those books and I said, wait a minute here, this stuff I'm reading here, this is, these antedate all that stuff Peter Brook and those guys are talking about. This uh -huh. is just what Peter Brook and all these folks are talking about. It's really an appropriation uh -huh. of these systems. Uh -huh. uh, you know, uh, let me just say this. Uh, it said was it, it, it was said that the Catholic Church does not mess with the religion of Voodoo, because if you actually go to a Voodoo ceremony and you go through the whole thing, you realize that all Catholicism is is Voodoo for dummies. <laughs> yeah, right. It's really interesting, right. and that's a lot of the yeah. stuff that we get from from Europe. But uh, just yeah. uh, again uh, filtered down of or, or, or well, you know, but even in the Catholic Church, for example, they have uh, people don't recognize it, but they have song, dance, and drum. The song, dance, and drum goes on inside of that. I mean, again, you know, you have the uh, the the liturgy, which is and the response call, the response, and then you have the dance, genuflection, boom, up, stand up, again. stand up, go back down again. That's all dance. You know? That's all, but, I mean, but it's much more controlled, much more structured inside a tight, very tidy kind of way of doing it. Uh, they have part of the ritual, of course, is, is antithetical to African sensibilities. You don't eat the, the corpse, you don't eat the body and drink the blood. I mean, that comes out of a whole other myth mythological sensibility. That's to me a whole other mythology that you know that's brought up in there, uh, uh, which, which we're not find that in Africa. I mean, in Africa. So, but what I'm getting at initially is that, the, the, well, primarily is that I rediscovered something in this African sacred system. Then I started looking backward at what I had experienced in the black churches in America, with, though I'm not a church person. I was never a person who went to church in a regular way, but I, I did go with friends of mine. And I said, wow, that's what that's all about. This comes directly out of the, out of the, out of the Afri African um, uh, sacred systems and what how do you create the pr how do you invite spirit into into the, in, into what you're doing spirit is the thing that that, that, that I mean uh, uh, it is through spirit that one becomes empowered is where, is where I'm looking at it it is not just simply a cognitive process where you sit down you write a play or you write a poem you, if you don't have the right rhythm and the repetitions inside of it it will never it, it will never invoke spirit yeah. Uh, two more points. Uh, uh, the reason why I bring this, this is very interesting because this cover is intriguing because it's, it's as you said, this whole phenomenology, this whole psychology, yeah. whatever have you, to me is in this cover. No, it is. That's why it's there. That's, that's that's Nelson, what, I want to ask you about this cover. That's a Nelson, well, that's a Nelson, Nelson Stevens painting. I saw Nelson and Larry, Larry and I were very fond of Nelson, we still, and, I, and I'm still, he's like a brother to me. Irish, three of us were paying together. Nelson was Afro Cobra person. He worked with the Afro Cobra uh, in Chicago. I, I don't know what Chicago, that is. Well, there's a, there's a Jeff Donaldson and some other uh, painters came together 
and, and formed a cooperative of people who had this kind of way of work. Uh, that, you know, that it was, in other words, it was a break from the traditional way of doing um, form mm -hmm. and color. And they were trying to find, and it's still, it's still in, in existence. And they, they, I think one of the big things they did do um, that was gave them, uh, that was very prominent back in the late 60s, but 69 or 60, 68, 69, they did the wall of respect. And, yeah. they, they, they did those, those, new, those huge murals. murals. Yeah. Uh, the, that's the first thing they started doing. These were like collective, it was a collective of different painters doing it. They all had their own way of work. Nelson worked like this. And this piece, the reason I have this particular piece, um, uh, is because it does very much uh, deal with the kind of, of the uh, energy. Here's a face. We know it's a face. Mm -hmm. We know it's a black face. But look at all the parts that make mm -hmm. up this whole, mm -hmm. and the energy in it. And the, and it's the energy. It's that rhythm. It's extraordinary. The rhythm inside of this piece this makes this a remarkable piece. And, um, uh, and, and I mean, Nelson found this, and, we, and Larry and I, we was working on this, you know, when, when we first met him, and he was studying at Kent, Kent State. Mm -hmm. And we would sit down, you know, I said, Larry, you gotta meet this guy. We sit down with him. And we would have these most remarkable conversations about aesthetics, about, about what he was doing. Because I think his initial impulse was just simply being, Resisted to the traditions of, of his other that were being followed by his classmates because he was the only black person in that program at the time at, at Kent State. And I, I think his initial impulse was he was just being resistant until he met with Larry and I and we began to open up what he was doing into some other kind of philosophical ideas mm -hmm. uh, which had to do with the aesthetics. The aesthetics are very important. Because up, uh, for me, it's very hard to go to the theater, for example, now. Uh, because I'm not interested in seeing a soap opera uh, or, uh, about black life. Uh, I'm not interested in even, I'm not even interested in the, in the, with the kind of journalistic reporting of black women being raped. Because in most cases now, the way it is set up is about black women being raped by black men. And it, t it takes the onus off of the the, the real source of these issues or these problems. So I don't go to the theater very much anymore unless the work has some ritualistic um, potential that invites me ritualistically, ritualistically into what they're doing so that it enlightens me about something that, that I was not enlightened about before. If it doesn't do that, then what's the point of my going? And I think that's the, that, that every time you hear, I mean, I've heard Monk play when, I, when, when he was playing when I was a kid, youngster, every time I heard him play, he might have played uh, Round About Midnight a hundred times, I might have heard it a hundred times. Every time I heard it, I heard something different. <laughs> I heard, no, I don't mean different as much as it was, it, it, it enlightened me in another kind of way. But that's going back to that church thing where you have you have the same text, there you well, go. and everybody knows the there text, but because it's almost like acting, you have to look, first you have to get rid of the script so that you can get into whatever you yeah, want to get yeah, into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly. So once, yeah, so once you get away, once you, once you can separate yourself from just the, uh, well, it's not about separation. It's about pulling together the things around you to, to bring um, a, a, a larger sense of you than simply the descriptive sense of what, what seems to be related but is not really related. You, you've got to pick out those things that are related to you. You've got to... Um, it's like I use in this most recent essay, the L's, oh, what's his name? I always forget these people's names. I talk about what is figure and what is ground. Mm. Mm. Let's, let's just use that as an example. What I, is figure and, and what, what is, is what's ground? And ground as in grounding? Grounding, or background, or what is oh, foreground. Okay, 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 what okay, is the okay, figure? Okay. Sitting here on a, in a park bench, you and I sitting here, and somebody is looking from afar, not afar, not too far, and they have a camera on us. Is that over there, are we the foreground or are we the background? Or, or what, in other words, if they were to take a, a, a wide image of this, you and I sitting here and there's the rest of this park and bicyclists and all that, all a lot of energy up in there, but 
what would be the picture here? You know, what would be, what would be grounded here? What would be figure here? In other words, if, to put it more, more succinctly, a black person and a white person on a subway, and something goes down on the subway, would experience that thing from two separate, distinct ways of understanding what happened. Mm. Even though it might have been something that is as clear, if you report it, this happened, this happened, this happened, the experience between that black person and that white person, how they engaged what happened, why it happened, would be dis distinctly different. Well, this is interesting. First of all, um, well, let me make this, this observation, and then I want to ask you about psychology, mm -hmm. because since that you have that as, mm -hmm. as a background thing. Uh, back in the, uh, I guess it was the early, when would I get back? I guess it was in the 80s, yeah, the early 80s at, 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 at NYU. Uh, I had a friend, John Harris Jr., who was a theater person, and he was helping these dancers do their project or something like that. And the project was they had uh, these two dancers, a black girl and a white girl. They were the same height, the same figure, everything like that. And the experiment was just to have them dance, the same number side by side. Where did your eyes go to? Mm -hmm. And the eyes always went to the black dancer. Okay, you know what I said? They had the same body type and everything mm -hmm. like that. Okay, so, so so my question is, I guess, psych, psych, psychologically, what is that? Yeah, it works in it works two ways. I mean, uh, uh, it's not a question of being better than, really. No, they were equal. No, no, yeah. no they're not better than, but there will be some information. If you're black, first of all, there will be some information in the body that, that will resonate you. Uh, in other words, even if the same gesture, inside of that gesture will be some kind of way to signify some familiar part of your own reality in the black body. That, that'll happen. The white person doing the very same gesture, that resonance will not be there. You know, and not to say it's off or wrong, it is simply not there. No, but the, 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 this audience, this is when we're in NYU in the, in the early 80s. Right. This was a, a basically a mixed audience, but mostly white audience. Yeah. And every, they had a survey, something like that, and everybody came with the same thing. Well, I'm, I'm all right, but I would imagine it would have to do with this particular, uh, uh, well, first of all, there is, the, I mean, it's not trying to be all, I can't be altogether certain, but I, I would say this. The moment you put a black person on the stage, everybody's eyes move over there. I'm sorry, Mr. The moment you put a black person on stage, everybody's eyes always go over there. Okay, everybody goes. That's, I mean, that's yeah. that's number one. I mean, he said, "Well, what are they there for?" <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so everyone's, and it, it, it stands out. The presence stands out. Uh, conversely, I would imagine if we were doing this in Africa in a village, and there was a white person there, everybody's eyes would be focused on that white person. I can give you an example. When I was in, in, in Mali, uh, and, and I was working on, trying to find, we were working on a film, I was looking for locations, and we went to a, a village to see if that might be a place to get a, 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 a Rio to tell us the story of Sundiata. And so we went in this village, and all the children, all, and that was a white producer, <clears throat> and a black producer, and myself, the writer. Three of us walk in to the village. With just huts and things like that. I would have thought all the black children came running up, they called ran, and they all ran up, you know. And they gave no attention to the white guy. They only gave attention to us. So I asked the same, a similar question to yours. To me, particularly, particularly me, I guess there were two things wrong with my thing. First of all, I had a T-shirt on and a camera around me. They had never seen a cousin like me before. I had a T-shirt on and I had my camera and moves bag. I was, I was looking very, very Western. The white guy, they paid no attention to him. But then it occurs to me the reason why they did not is because they were used to seeing 
the colonial people come into the village, the white colonials come in and and make, make, make themselves present in, among them. Yeah. They're used to that. They paid no attention to him. But to me, this younger black guy, man, with his camera on and it's hot weather, he don't know Jalaba, no nothing. He was out there. He must be crazy. Who is his brother? <laughs> Who is his cousin out here? Let, let's, the... <laughs> let, let's help him out of his misery that he's going to experience that he doesn't know he's going to experience. Oh, man. I, and the heat, man, was like unbelievable. And I was pressed by and like, and they all loved to me, see me. And all the children gathered around me. And it was like, and, and also the black woman also. But they didn't know why they messed with him. They didn't care about him, because they were used to seeing him, apparently. You know, um, in that village, I mean, it's not true in the city, but in Bamako, it's different, but I mean, in this, in this rural village situation. Um, so, that, so, so, so the question is, what, what is generating tension for you? What, what is pulling the eye? You know, it depends on your particular experience, your particular experience, psychologically speaking. You know, with those particular images. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's not like, um, there's no, uh, I don't think there's any particular, um, they're not making, uh, in some cases, if you, if you ask the same thing in Mississippi, um, uh, no, there would not necessarily be an indictment of the image, you know, the West is not truly really sort of like, oh, I don't like that place at all. No, it's just basically just to look at it. Well, as you ask the question, what draws the eye? Uh, I would imagine, though, in Harlem, in an all-black context, the eyes might move toward the white person just because of this a curiosity. What is she doing here? What is she in that mix for? You know, I mean, in, 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 in the context, in the white context, all the eyes move toward the black. I mean, those are, those are interesting yeah. kind of racial things are very interesting in this country. Mm -hmm. They're not interesting. It's, they're, they're foolish. But, you know, it's kind of yeah. um, uh, 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 people's identities are tied into race. I don't like to talk race too much because it, it's a very simple minded conversation. I, I call it a false construct. It's a totally it's, false construct. And it's a convenient one. It's, it's a very convenient one. Uh, to keep to keep a, an artificial discourse going on, that, you know, that separates various people, which is why it's so vitally important, as I used to say, uh, uh, to be able to have a concreteness about who your identity you begin to. Uh, once you have a clarity about what serves you as a as a human being, once it is clear to you that you you have a particular uh, one of the the best things that European Americans have is a sense of their own personal history. It strengthens them in their behavior. Now, they have comforts in that. The Southern and the Northern, they have different kinds of sense of who they are and what they're about and what serves them best in their own history. But they at least have a history. They have a sense of everything reporting to them in their view reports them as European Americans. Every building you see, everything that uh, uh, the, the language, the way the language is, is constructed, it it, it, it certainly uh, reinforces all the things that are about being a Euro-American. And if you want to be here, like Donald Trump said, they don't even speak the language. Mm -hmm. I gotta get them to speak the language. <laughs> I mean, they really believe Americans really believe they're exceptional because of a particular history. Black Americans, or Asian Americans, of course, feel the same way. They feel very, very exceptional. And they come through here with a full sense of who they are as Asian people. They get out and live out in California for two or three generations. They start acting American and behaving American, talking American, sound like Valley Girls and all that stuff. But at the same time, they do, at a certain moment, come together around certain kind of cultural values, not because of a single event like Kwanzaa that was constructed in the last 30 years or so, but because they have a kind of continuity of who they are as human beings. And it's the, once you have, a, have developed a sense, of, a sense of continuity, it's very, it, it, you can move almost anywhere in this country without feeling, uh, without feeling uh, when they come at you at race, you say, oh, you're talking to me. 
Who are you talking to? I'm not that you're denying blackness. Yeah, I'm the black guy here. But what are you talking to? Are you talking to this construct out here, a race? You think because I am here, I must come from a impoverished family and somebody gave me a, a free ride to be in your company? You know, every time I go to a party where I'm the only black person, I don't do that very often, by the way. I used to do that years ago. When I used to go to parties, people always, invariably in the sweetest way, say, well, well how do you know so-and-so? <laughs> like, how did you get here? Yeah, yeah. You know, what makes you special to be here? And of course, once I figured that out as a youngster in my, in my 20s, I mean, I had all kinds of responses to that that would cut them off in the past. By the time I hit my 40s, I was fairly clear about who I was and why I was, etc. You know, I never, I never had to be, I never am concerned with that. I, never, I mean, from anyone, uh, you know, who I am, what I am, what my identification is. So, okay.